<laughs> this is a bright show, right? So bright. Yeah. Well, well today we're going to go a little bit different, mm. okay? We're going to go to places that you may not be ready for, but that's okay because we're going to go there together. Yeah. We have a very special guest for you guys today who's going to be taking us to places that you may not be quite ready for. A phenomenal actor, producer. Andy, who do we have on the show today? Today's guest is William Mark McCullough. He's been on every streaming platform known to man. He's known internationally and nationally in, in movies, independent films, and studio-made films. And, and he's going to scare the pants off you today, He is folks. very unique in what he has to say, so stay tuned for that. I'm, I'm Josh Johnson. And it's Andy. And welcome to The Perfect Time. Oh, in the morning, nothing compares to waking up. Listen to me. This might be normal in your family, but it's not right. Your mom's going to need some help. Today's guest is William Mark McCullough. He is on every TV show known to man, uh, pretty much. You can catch him on a film such as American Maid, starring opposite Tom Cruise. You can catch him in Sweet Magnolias. You can catch him in uh, The Fear of the Walking Dead and Ellie's Finest. And I just, I love Mark. I got to work with him five or six years ago now like on a movie and been just one of the greatest friends and mentors. And so thank you for joining us today, Mark. Thank, thank you for having me. me. I'm excited. Um, now, can you walk me through, because I know you have the most interesting story as to how you became the amazingly successful actor that you are now. Can you just walk me through kind of what sparked that interest in you and how your evolution as a person and as an actor? Sure. So I was in college and I was studying political science mm -hmm. and it was a liberal arts school. So you had to take, you know, classes from every category and I had to take an art class. And the only two classes available at the time was art history or acting. And I was like, well, I'll fail art history. So I'll <laughs> acting class. And I remember I went in with such disdain, right? Because, you know, I love theater kids, but I'm not my theater kid. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, but I remember going to class and uh, the, the teacher gave me a monologue to do. Hmm. I corrupted and I've never done crack but I've <laughs> that that's what it feels like because I finished this monologue and there's like 11 people in class you know fluorescent lights like all time and my whole body was tingling it was just like this is amazing and it was it was the final monologue from uh from Dr. Faustus but yeah it, it, it just it made me fall in love with it immediately hmm. and we have great professors great teachers but the failing of, of the school, and, and I love the school, but one of the things I see with lots of schools is they taught the craft of how to act on stage, but not one minute about how to get a job once you got out of school. Mm. So I graduated with no idea about wow. anything, and certainly no idea about how to work in film and TV. Mm -hmm. It was mm. specifically a, a, a theater program. Mm. And um, like a lot of lost souls, I decided, well, you know, I'll go to law school. That'll give me three years, and, and maybe getting in front of a jury will feed that performance thing. Most lawyers are lost souls, so it makes sense. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, and so I took a trip down to Nicaragua with some with uh, a couple of friends, and was in this horrible car crash. And oh, I spent no. about five weeks in the hospital there. Oh wow! But it opened my eyes because I'm laying in this hospital, and I'm like, you know, I almost died, and I'm on this path hmm. that I don't enjoy. And the only reason I'm sticking to it is because so many people told me, "You've already gone so far down the path. You're crazy to get off of it now." Hmm. And it opened my eyes. And so when I was well enough to leave Nicaragua and back to the States, I quit my job, moved to LA knowing no one, having no money. And uh, I started what I lovingly call my ramen noodle years. <laughs> right? As I just <laughs> I can, struggled. I can relate to we that. Can both yeah. 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 I just struggled and messed up. And I'm still in my ramen noodle years. <laughs> <laughs> well, Feels like that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So that was it. Like it was just, you know, it, it was a, so I wasn't one of those, those kids who at six years old, was like, I'm going to be an actor. I was not me. I, I kind of fell into it. Like by, me. That, that was me. Yeah. There's a lot of people. You better love acting. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I had never figured out the business and I had only done student films and short films and low budget feature films, I hope no one ever sees. Right? <laughs> I've only done that the rest of my life yeah. while working a job to pay my bills. I would have died a happy man because I loved acting, mm -hmm. right? Now, I was fortunate to figure out what to do business-wise to turn it into a business. But when I meet people and they're like, oh, I want to be an actor, I'm like, do you really want to be an actor? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to be famous? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. I have a, mm -hmm. I have a, a little niece. See, I just want to be famous. I don't want to be <laughs> I don't want to go through the work or the rejection or any of that. 
just right to the fame. That's no. all I want. Well, I have a little niece who she came to me and she was nine, and uh, she's like, she's like, oh, Mark, I, I want to be an actress. I yeah. Like, okay, I can help you out with that. And yeah. So I give her a little scene to go study. You know, I was like, you just memorize this, and we'll go practice on camera. And she looks at it. She, goes, I don't want to work. What do you ah. do? <laughs> to work, and I was like, "Well, I thought you would be an actress." So she's like, "You don't understand. I'm gonna walk on red carpet yeah. <laughs> and have people take pictures of me." Yes, uh, got, it. got it. She knows what she likes. She hey, likes. Uh, and that's when you open up girls. the TikTok app and you say, "I think this might be for you." Exactly. Exactly. Can you do this yeah. and that? It was awesome. There that's, you go. Yeah. Amazing. I love it. But I think you know, you speaking of of the the failing of the schools mm -hmm. and a lot of art schools the same they just they don't teach you how to get a job the business of acting the work mm -hmm. ethic the discipline of acting you get the you know the maybe the approach or the technique but i think you're writing a lot of those wrongs because then you went out and actually have been teaching mm -hmm. actors young actors older actors you know the right way to self tape and everything that you've learned through, as you might call it, your, your ramen days, right. um, and failing forward, and I think that's such a an amazing testament um, mm -hmm. to to what an art what an artist who is accomplishing things or is successful in, in the industry really has had to do mm -hmm. to get to where they are, and that and why you have the perspective that you have. So I know that you you've been telling me a story a, a while ago about how you knocked on doors. Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. So. What I learned about how to become a successful actor, mm -hmm. I didn't realize this until later in life, that everything I needed to know about how to become a successful actor, I'd learned in college selling vacuum cleaners door to door. Mm. So, I got, Mark Cuban. <laughs> yeah. So I got this job, and I, I remember, you know, me and a bunch of other young guys would jump into this van, and the owner would take us to a neighborhood. We'd jump out and just go knock, cold knock on doors and try to sell these ridiculously expensive vacuum <laughs> And I remember the very first day, all the guys in the van with were complaining about the fact that they had to knock on 100 doors to sell one vacuum. Right. And they're just complaining, complaining, complaining. So right. anyway, you, you knock on 100 doors and you sell a vacuum cleaner. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I know the secret of this thing. And, and the problem is these guys, they would knock on door one and the person would yell at them, call the name, slam the door in the face. Mm -hmm. And they would take it as a personal rejection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And every door, they took it as a rejection of them or their product. Mm -hmm. So by door 17, they were going home because they couldn't take the onslaught of, of rejection. Yeah. Yeah. They, they took it as a rejection. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what I did is I went to door one, fully prepared to sell that that person on the side of the door a vacuum cleaner. And when they slammed the door, I went to the next one. And on door 37, walk up to it, fully prepared to sell it. When they slammed the door in my face, I said, okay, I've got more door, you know, I got whatever's left to, to go. And I sold a vacuum cleaner every single day. And I wasn't a very good salesman. I know nothing about vacuum cleaners. Mm -hmm. I don't really care. You didn't have any sales experience? No, I never never sold anything. Hmm. But what I did know is they're not rejecting me. Mm -hmm. They don't know me. Mm -hmm. They haven't seen this really expensive vacuum cleaner do all the magic it can do. So they're not even really rejecting that vacuum mm -hmm. cleaner. Mm -hmm. They have their own thing going on. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I just didn't take it personally. Wow. I just kept knocking on doors. So door 87, I knocked. They slam. I go, 13 more to go. Wow. Right? And, and here's the crazy thing. I, I think I mentioned this to you before. Mm. Every couple months, I go back to the same neighborhoods and knock on the same doors wow. again. And there'd always be someone who would either slam the door in my face or cuss me out who then bought a vacuum cleaner. Wow. Right? And so what I learned with acting is, number one, you just keep knocking. Mm. Right? Don't get any. I, I have no attachment to results on any particular audition. Mm. I just do my audition, have fun. When I'm doing it, I fully expect to book it. But as soon as I turn it in, it's gone, I move on to the next door, right? Mm. And then the thing with coming back to the neighborhood and having someone who has already slammed the door in your face by a vacuum cleaner, I realize they're not saying, I don't want your product. Mm. They're saying, I don't need your product yet. Mm. Right? Timing. It's yeah. timing. Yeah. Mm. So, so yeah, so everything I, I needed to know about acting, I learned it selling vacuum cleaners. It just took me a little while to like put two and two together and realize, yep. ah, this is the approach to take. That's wonderful. And I love that in what you said, there's a lot of like releasing of what you can't control and focusing on what you can, which is the act, your next step, mm -hmm. right? Your next step is always something that you can focus on and keep yourself in motion. Um, and I love that idea of timing that you mentioned because it's never on our own timing. And I'm sure that, you know, when you started auditioning and you, and you kept developing your craft, you wanted to be on specific shows but you weren't going to get on those shows whenever you wanted. Mm -hmm. But now, years later, now I, we got to 
have you on the show because you happen to be in LA mm -hmm. shooting what I think you told me is your dream show. But it is my favorite TV show of all time. Of all uh, time. Of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you had asked, mm -hmm. uh, if you'd asked me the first day I decided to become an actor, mm -hmm. can you pick a TV show you'd like to be on? I would have written the show down. Say by the bell. That's mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, okay, so so you mentioned in your story too, as you got to LA, you figured it out. You fin figured out the business side of mm -hmm. acting. Um, and I know a really big thing for you um, and what you teach actors is branding, mm -hmm. right? The importance of finding your niche because we all have something unique to contribute. So can you speak a little bit about that if there's someone out there that maybe wants to become an actor or, or is really in love with the craft of acting, mm -hmm. how they can transition to the business side. Sure. I mean, the business covers a lot of things. Branding is one part of that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important part. But, uh, you know, coming from a theater background, mm -hmm. like there's a suspension of disbelief for an audience who's sitting and watching a play. Mm -hmm. And so you can play a 90-year-old man. You know, I can play a 75-year-old woman. And people go, oh, cool. This is this play. Mm -hmm. But for TV and film, with the camera is right here. Mm. You can't get away with that, yeah. with some except you're famous, you can do whatever you want. To, right? <laughs> but it's just your. But as the working class actor who's just out there doing jobs, um, you've got to learn to bring yourself to roles. Mm. Um, and the key, though, is you must figure out when you bring your honest, true self to a role. Mm -hmm. How do people out there perceive you? Because mm -hmm. very seldom do people perceive you the way you perceive yourself. Mm. So, when I moved to LA, I moved here with this idea that the world saw me the way I perceived myself, which is a young, justice-seeking lawyer type that was good and heroic and opened doors for old ladies. And, you know, that that's how I saw myself. And hopefully my family and friends saw me the same way. <laughs> that is not how casting directors, directors, producers, and network execs saw me. Mm. And I didn't know that. And I kept trying to transform myself for every role. I kept trying to, like, become this character, become that character. And was having no luck. Mm. And eventually I was chatting with the casting director and she said, you know, I, I've seen you do a hundred auditions, you know, self-tape auditions. And mm -hmm. she says, every once in a while you get a call back. She says, but you, you have a book for us. And she says, the problem is, I don't know what you bring to the table because mm. you've done a hundred characters. Mm. And she says, the problem is when you come up with this callback, you did a good enough job to get the callback, but you're never going to beat the dude who naturally is that. Wow. She says, you can't outact him wow. and being him. Mm -hmm. She's like, figure out what makes you special. Mm -hmm. Bring him to the audition. Mm -hmm. So I went back to this to this uh, branding uh, worksheet I'd done years before. I said, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna check this out. And so I looked at it and I implemented it. I made my marketing match it. And one month later, I booked my first network TV show. And then a month later, booked another network TV show. And then just went boom, 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 boom. Wow. And what's interesting is like the first role I booked on network TV was literally called T-shirt guy. <laughs> Five lines, and show about <laughs> secrets and lies, and uh, T-shirt guy playing the exact same type of role that I'm playing now on TV show, where I'm the talk show guest star, the main villain on the episode, um, because the essence is the same. Mm -hmm, right? And so, <clears throat> T-shirt guy is a villain. Uh, T-shirt guy was yeah, he was this uh, he was this rough, violent redneck mm -hmm. who confronts the main star of the show. So that was your true essence. The yeah, two what, casting directors. Yeah, well, what I realized is is mm -hmm. when people don't know me mm -hmm. and I walk through, especially on camera, what I give off, the energy I give off is is darker. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, once you realize that, though, it allows you to do auditions and do performances, and you don't have to do much because I know what's coming, what's coming, the energy that comes out of me. So I can go in and do an audition and for some kind of violent, you know, bad guy. Mm -hmm. And I can be very subtle and get the point across. Mm -hmm. Whereas another actor who doesn't have that natural energy has to work really hard. Mm -hmm. Well, my audition is always going to look more authentic and real mm -hmm. because I naturally give that off. You know? So I'm so glad that you brought that up and your branding is that you're the villain. Okay. Uh, for those of you at home who are wondering, why I'm dressed like this. Everyone was wondering. Yeah, Everyone's been wondering this, this the white episode. coat. I normally wear a blue coat wondering. with interviews. You were wondering. You were probably wondering. <laughs> I decided to brand myself as the good guy. Since you are the villain, <laughs> I'm going to brand myself today as the good guy. I like it. Um, yeah. Is it working? So I figured you're, you're kind of the mediator in between the, the, the dark side nice. and the light side, like but... 
This is like, this is where Angelic, I wanted to there's go. There's like a there's a hue of light that just emits. The ain the, the wings just... didn't fit on the camera, so I had to leave those. <laughs> you had to leave those. Leave those in the green room. But <laughs> nice. That was that was the essence behind my. Oh, yeah, I love it. I didn't want to bring too much. You know, I want to balance it out because yeah. I knew you were going to bring that that dark energy to the to the right. show this morning. Perfect. And so I wanted to just balance it out. Good. Yeah. And we have balance, and I I, I don't mm -hmm. know. I'm like the referee or something. Yeah. I feel like I'm in a like a, a fantasy now. Just, <laughs> we're just we're just getting <laughs> yeah. started. And I'm like I'm like the, the one stuck in the middle. Like why are things happening to me? Yeah, yeah. The good angel and the bad angel right here. Oh, like the, on the court, on like the shoulder. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. who should I listen to? Um, don't do it. No. <laughs> Definitely do it. <laughs> yes. Don't drink out of the mug. <laughs> you don't know what's in there. <laughs> wow. They're going to torture us. Pull our tongues out through our necks. That ain't helping, Pete. They're gonna cut us up in little pieces, feed us to the pigs. I won't be fed no pigs, Barry. Okay, so so we talked about branding. Very good, well-branded individuals here on my either side. Um, so now I want to talk about how you've now transitioned from acting to also producing and directing, and you just finished producing, directing, writing your first feature film, mm -hmm. I believe, wow. as a writer, director, mm -hmm. um, A Savannah Haunting. Yes. Can we hear a little bit more about what that process and transition was like for you? Sure. Well, it, Savannah Haunting will be coming out to theaters and to uh, digital platform gates. So oh, that's so that. cool. Um, Which theaters? Is it nationwide? It's going to be, uh, we don't know all the theaters yet, okay. we should know this week, but uh -huh. uh, if you check out, you know, find us on social media, we'll, we'll have all that listed. Sweet. But, um, Here's the link. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's, you know, I, I live in a house in Savannah, Georgia that is haunted. And so, and my, my family lived in it for decades mm -hmm. and being in a haunted house, there's a, like a real haunted house. There's, there's a, mm -hmm. a sensation about mm -hmm. that that you don't usually I've been, see. I've been in them. Yeah. I lived in one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I wrote this script with the idea of capturing what it's like to be in a real haunted house and in a real haunted house. In my experience, mm -hmm. monsters aren't crawling out of the walls. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not mm -hmm. pouring out of the faucets. Yep. You know, yep. it's this, it's this growing, creeping dread. Yep. And it's almost like the house is just every day mm -hmm. closing in on mm -hmm. yeah. So, I, I wrote the script to try to capture that sensation. Wow. And at the same time, you know, I talked to a lot of people who had been in the house through the years and got their experiences in the house and incorporated those experiences into the script. Hmm. And we cast really good actors. But the other thing is. I sh we shot the movie in in my house, mm -hmm. and uh, they all had these really creepy, scary experiences. So they, I was talking to uh, the, our lead actress earlier this week, and she was saying how every day she'd come to the house and she could feel it, mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. it affected her performance in a in a positive way. Mm -hmm. So her, as in, she was genuinely terrified. She was genuinely terrified. Great. <laughs> and they all had these like crazy, creepy experiences in the house, mm -hmm. and so you feel that when you watch the movie. It, it it's even though it's a it's a horror film, mm -hmm. the level of uh, of depth to their acting is really solid. Wow. So yeah. you shot the location was actually the haunted house, yep. and I can actually verify. That, that it does feel. You've been there? You, I've been there. I, when I took my cross country trip, I stayed in one of the rooms and it oh was. Oh my gosh. It was actually terrifying. I, I believe I had, I, I wrote down the experiences or we talked about them mm -hmm. at the time. This was like four, three years ago, three or four years ago. And, and yeah, I, I could totally sense that. But it, it's so cool that you turned that very same place that inspired everything into the actual set. That, that mm -hmm. is not a common thing at all. Well, you know, I always knew from the beginning that. The house is so unique, as you, and you've been there. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to just go find some house to shoot, in, and, I, and and I didn't want to create a set, mm -hmm. right? Because in the movie, the the house is really a character in the film. Like, mm -hmm. There's a lot of shots that we that we did to get the sensation of the house is watching the family. Mm -hmm. The movie really is, in many ways, we kind of describe it as a uh, supernatural drama mm -hmm. because we really watched this mom emotionally fall apart because of the loss of her daughter mm -hmm. and the supernatural forces basically lean into that they they take advantage of her of her weakness mm -hmm. and and try to rip the family apart you know the, the the film's set in savannah and it deals with the history of slavery in the south it deals with there's a strong long history of voodoo in savannah specifically and it deals a lot with that mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's been interesting. Uh, well, so it's fictional, but you've incorporated historical elements into the piece. You've incorporated your own maybe personal experiences mm -hmm. or, or the actual set of the place that is haunted and mm -hmm. inspired it. Um, and you being an actor first and, and well, you know, we're, we're all a lot of different things, but mm -hmm. I can imagine that it really leans into the character development. Uh, which you don't really get horror films sometimes can be a little, you know, and it's a thriller, of course, but can be a little bit about the horror mm -hmm. part or the gore. And so it's really refreshing to hear that there's uh, a real arc and a real like uh, connection that an audience can have mm -hmm. to this mother's experience or to the characters in the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you one of the things I found very interesting. You know, there's some things about the script that I wrote that I just made up. Right? Mm -hmm. And after we finished the film, we decided to do a documentary about the real haunting. We brought in tons of experts. All right, uh, so it's two separate films. Two separate films. Same uh, house. Same house. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but to find out what, what caused this haunting. Mm. And mm. one of the one of the points in the in the narrative film is there was a you know plantation on the property, mm. and during the Civil War it gets burned down. Some mm -hmm. stuff goes on. I won't, I won't give away. And then the house is there now. It's built over the plant the mm. plantation's you know foundation. Okay. I made that up. <laughs> However, that's very convincing. <laughs> well, we brought in historians and found out that the property that had had a plantation that burned down during the Civil War. No, we no. oh, <laughs> think you made it up. Did you? Made it up. Yeah. And there were several instances about that. Chills. There, there's a little girl that plays a very big role in the movie uh -huh. uh, from a supernatural perspective, and I personally had not experienced the little girl. We bring in a bunch of people doing interviews with them after we shot the movie. And literally 20 people talked about their experience with a little girl uh, in the house, either seeing her, talking to her, hearing her laugh. And I, I just... I don't know if I can watch this movie now. I'm a little, oh, a little scared gosh. already. <laughs> wow. That's and, terrifying. Uh, wait, wait. But my favorite part, Mark, is that... You really are a villain, aren't you? <laughs> no, my favorite part is that you still live in this house. I mean, you've known it's haunted forever. And you're just like, yep, this is my haunted house that I still wow. live in forever. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, the reason for that is because my dad, <laughs> my dad lived in the house so for cool. decades, and oh, like he saw the work he did to it. So for me, yeah. it was like it was a battle between me and the stuff because it was terrifying. When I first moved wow. into the house, my dad had passed away, and it was terrifying. And there was something in the upstairs bedroom. Mm. That's right, the footsteps up the stairs. No, that was one stop. of them. Yes, I remember no. so well. I thought he had come up to say hi to that no. at one point, and I was like, Mark. <laughs> Well, we brought in a specialist from L.A. to the house, and she said, what's in that upstairs bedroom is not a dead human. It is something much darker. And so, yeah, it was uh, – there was a point I'm never where going back. if I had to <laughs> – well, I, I won't get too much of it. That I, we dealt with. No but way. there was a point where at noon I wouldn't go upstairs. Like if I had to go upstairs, I would call my business partner, be on the phone with her to walk upstairs in my house at noon. Because it was so terrifying. Did you just have a moment? Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> I, I needed a second. That was oh my god. That was a little too much to handle. <laughs> but what we're doing is a little different Lord. narrative. Mm. We're opening. So glad I'm wearing this jacket today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just feel just, I feel holier like wearing it. I'm gonna need to <laughs> sage the studio <laughs> after you leave today. Oh my gosh. Oh. I end the the last thing you see is real security cam footage from my house. No, stop. <laughs> I won't give away what the screen can No. Yeah. What, what's that movie? Uh, they, the movie where they film at night in the bed. And, oh, 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 the terrifying. paranormal activity. Oh, that's what it reminds yeah. me of. Oh, that's the reason why I will. Yeah. I, this I, one's I, real, though. Oh. <laughs> this one's not. <laughs> yeah. But probably, you know, life informs uh, fiction. And so fiction this footage is going to be on the second movie that's about the house? Yes, the documentary. The documentary? Well, so we have the full feature length documentary. Yeah. But mm -hmm. to. We really wanted to, to hit home with the audiences that the, the narrative film mm. is based on real events. Mm. So we book, we, we really call it bookshelf, book, book in. Book we end. book in the narrative yes. film with interviews from the documentary at the beginning and end of the film. Oh, so it, it almost right. promotes it. Mm -hmm. in a way. Okay, so that's us, Savannah Haunting. Make sure you check it out in theaters and online and all its platforms. Cause and bring a friend. And bring a friend bring so a friend that you're not alone during the experience. Terrifying. Yeah. Um, Mark, I go, I'm going to be probably holding on to your <laughs> yeah, arm. Very, oh, man. I, I don't know. This, this is a, a mutual <laughs> shield user. Um, terrifying. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy that you were in town. Happened to be in L.A. so that we could have you on the show and get your amazing wisdom and inspiration uh, on here. And I am so excited for you to be fulfilling your life's 
ambition and on your on your favorite TV show. So, well, guys, thank you for having me. It's the last time. Absolutely, no, you did. Your 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 stories are amazing, and uh, your movie sounds fascinating and terrifying at the same time. So, so uh, I'm sure to check that out, and uh, we'll put a link below for you guys to check out uh, how you can see that movie and uh, much more of his work. All right, so uh, Josh, do you think this is a good time to go hide under the covers? Uh, I think it's a perfect time to go hide under the covers. <laughs> <laughs> Mark. And we're out. Nice.